sorry, just one more. Within that region, we've also had seen um, uh, a lot of instability in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. um, is is that something that the White House has a position on? Yeah, we have obviously, um, as you noted, we have seen that, and we have uh, we're monitoring reports of protests in Kazakhstan. We support calls for calm, for protesters to express themselves peacefully, and for authorities to exercise uh, restraint. Um, there are some crazy uh, Russian claims uh, about the U.S. being behind this, so let me just use this opportunity to convey that as absolutely false and clearly a part of the standard Russian disinformation playbook we've seen a lot of in past years. Go ahead. Thank you, Jed. Uh, on this plan or agreement that the White House had with Walmart and Kroger to sell those rapid tests at cost, did the White House make an effort to extend that agreement? Well, I'm not going to get into details of our private conversations with these providers. It was a set number of a set period of time. But what's important to um, for people to understand, or the American people to understand, is that our focus is, of course, ensuring that we are increasing access and, and access to free tests to people across the country. So obviously, that has been the case. Selling them at cost, something that we strongly supported, advocated for for the last uh, couple of months. Uh, since that time, uh, the president has quadrupled the size of our testing capacity. We have announced the intention to um, purchase 500 million. We're in the process of finalizing those contracts, of course. Tests, we've made 20,000 testing sites available. We've opened a range of federal testing sites across the country. So our objective is to continue to expand access to free tests uh, for the American people across the country. And I'd also note, of course, next week, uh, people can submit uh, to their insurers, and we'll have more details on that. I know you asked about that yesterday, on how that will work. Um, can submit to their uh, employers, or I mean, sorry, to their insurance companies to get reimbursed for their tests as well. But I guess
much, uh, Leader Schumer. Well said. Um, I will now introduce our witness, uh, Mr. Thomas Major, the Chief of the United States Capitol Police. Uh, Chief Major was sworn into his current position on July 21st, 2021. He joined the department following a distinguished 42-year career in law enforcement, most recently serving for 15 years as Chief of Police in Montgomery County, Maryland. During that time, he was also elected by his peers across the country to serve as the president of the Major City Chiefs Association. Earlier in his career, he served as chief of police in Fairfax County, Virginia, where he rose through the ranks after first joining the force following his graduation from the University of Maryland. I will now swear in our witness. Chief Major, if you could please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before the committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You can be seated. You are now recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Klobuchar, Ranking Member Blunt, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak about the significant improvements that we've made following the events of January 6th and to speak about the work that remains to be done. I want to begin by acknowledging the men and women of the Capitol Police who work so tirelessly to fulfill their mission of protecting the U.S. Capitol, the members of Congress, and the legislative process every day. It's my honor to work with these women and men who performed so courageously a year ago. And while I'm proud of our officers, the events of January 6th did expose critical departmental failures and deficiencies with operational planning, intelligence, staffing, training, and equipment. I'm pleased to report that we have addressed a significant portion of the many recommendations issued to the department. In fact, of the more than 100 recommendations issued by the Inspector General, we have implemented and are addressing over 90 of them. The staff report issued by your committee listed five recommendations directed to the United States Capitol Police. I can tell you that the department has implemented or is in the process of implementing each one of them. I'm prepared to discuss many of the recommendations today, but understanding the time limitations, I'll focus on the improvements that are the most impactful and that address the core of the committee's findings and conclusions. I've provided under separate cover for inclusion in the official hearing record a more complete formal statement that includes a detailed list of all the department's post-January 6th improvements. The committee concluded that an important contributing factor to the breach of the Capitol was the lack of a department-wide operational plan for the joint session. An important first step we took to address that concern was the onboarding of a former Secret Service official with extensive experience in major event and national special security event planning. Guided by his expertise, we now take a multi-phased approach to our planning, to our planning process with a focus on information gathering, intelligence, asset determination, internal coordination, and most importantly, department-wide dissemination of all intelligence and critical information before all large and high-risk events. This also includes the creation of the department's first critical incident response plan, which now allows us to more effectively and more quickly obtain assistance from partner agencies. In short, a blueprint for operational planning has been created and put into place for all future significant events. If January 6th taught us anything, it's that preparation matters. Immediately after the 6th, the department focused on the need to strengthen our frontline officers, the Civil Disturbance Unit, or CDU. For any demonstration that involves violence or the potential for violence, the need for a well-trained and well-equipped CDU is crucial. Recognizing the tactical importance of our CDU officers, we've developed a plan to elevate their status and incentivize them to remain in the unit. The plan entails the creation of eight hard platoons. These platoons will be permanent units whose members train together and are deployed together. We've done other things as well to strengthen the CDU and make it more effective. One such measure is the establishment of the bicycle response team, which works in coordination with CDU. We can now deploy 100 trained and certified bike officers, as well as eight trained and certified officials to complement the CDU operations. Of course, our first responders can't do their job without the proper equipment. 
Therefore, we've reviewed all CDU equipment and upgraded it extensively to protect our officers and enhance our ability for crowd control. Our improvements have touched every component of the U.S. Capitol Police Department, but few changes are as dramatic as the ones that we've made to the way we gather, analyze, share, use, and disseminate intelligence. However, improvements to the department's lead intelligence component, the Intelligence and Interagency Coordination Division, began before January 6th. The department recognized that the IICD's decentralized structure had created informational silos. The continued focus on this has yielded significant improvements, including a nationwide search for a permanent intelligence director. The department is in the final stages of that process. We should have somebody on board in the coming weeks. The development of a United States Capitol Police intelligence product that is now shared with the intelligence community. The issuance of a daily intelligence report distributed to all officers and officials within the department. A biweekly classified intelligence briefing coordination with intelligence and law enforcement partners in advance of large or high-profile events, the realignment of task force officers to enhance intelligence sharing and dissemination, and the authorization for increased staffing. In fact, we've added nine new intelligence analysts. We continue to be forward-looking in our efforts to ensure that the department has a strong and proven intelligence collection, analysis, and dissemination program. I want to thank the committee for its ongoing support during this process, in particular your support for the Capitol Police Emergency Act. I also acknowledge and appreciate the support that we have received from the Capitol Police Board. Today, I'm confident that the U.S. Capitol Police Department has made significant progress addressing the deficiencies that impacted the department's response on January 6th. And while more work remains to be done, the men and women of the Capitol Police stand ready to fulfill their mission each and every day. Thank you.
we have taken thus far will not be our last. The Justice Department remains committed to holding all January 6 perpetrators at any level accountable under law, whether they were present that day or were otherwise criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. We will follow the facts wherever they lead. Because January 6 was an unprecedented attack on the seat of our democracy, we understand that there is broad public interest in our investigation. We understand that there are questions about how long the investigation will take and about what exactly we are doing. Our answer is, and will continue to be, the same answer we would give to, with respect to any ongoing investigation as long as it takes and whatever it takes for justice to be done consistent with the facts and the law. I understand that this may not be the answer some are looking for, but we will and we must speak through our work. Anything else jeopardizes the viability of our investigations and the civil liberties of our citizens. Everyone in this room and on these screens is familiar with the way we conduct investigations, and particularly complex investigations. We build investigations by laying a foundation. We resolve more straightforward cases first because they provide the evidentiary foundation for more complex cases. Investigating the more overt crimes generates linkages to less overt ones. Overt actors and the evidence they provide can lead us to others who may also have been involved. And that evidence can serve as a foundation for further investigative leads and techniques. In circumstances like those of January 6, a full accounting does not suddenly materialize. To ensure that all those criminally responsible are held accountable, we must collect the evidence. We follow the physical evidence. We follow the digital evidence. We follow the money. But most important, we follow the facts. Not an agenda or an assumption. The facts tell us where to go next. Over 40 years ago, in the wake of the Watergate scandal, the Justice Department concluded that the best way to ensure the Department's independence, integrity, and fair application of our laws and therefore, the best way to ensure the health of our democracy is to have a set of norms to govern our work. The central norm is that in our criminal investigations, there cannot be different rules depending on one's political party or affiliation. 
There cannot be different rules for friends and foes, and there cannot be different rules for the powerful and the powerless. There is only one rule. We follow the facts and enforce the law in a way that respects the Constitution and protects civil liberties. We conduct every investigated investigation guided by the same norms, and we adhere to those norms even when, and especially when, the circumstances we face are not normal. Thank you.